and this is going to be done by having our uh, slider. So very simple, uh, just go to slider.com and hashtag gender equality. And the simple question is going to be, why are you here? Uh, keep it short, uh, keep it short just for us to know um, why you're here, what do you expect? Is it for personal reasons? Is it because you want to empower, um, create some sort of women empowerment programs in your workplace? Uh, so just go for it. Any question, any answer is a good answer. It just creates a bit of understanding for us of your expectations. To become a better manager, thank you very much. Anyone else? Answers will slowly come through. It's a little bit of a delay sometimes with slider. Building diversity inclusion strategy, beautiful. Support DNI efforts, okay. Interesting topic. Fair enough, very good. Okay, anyone else? There's also a uh, comment in the, in the chat about broadening perspectives. Okay. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, Craig. Starting conversations at work and workplace issues. Yeah, from my experience uh, as a diversity inclusion trainer, uh, it's quite uh, common for a lot of companies to be more of a reactive when it comes to diversity inclusion than proactive. And I've had, I can tell you hundreds of stories, maybe not hundreds, but uh, at least 10 when I talk to a company and trying to convince them that you need, you need uh, to embrace diversity, you need to start doing something about that. And they say, no, 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 we are good. We are international. We are very inclusive. We are good. Don't worry about it. Uh, we have it all under control. And then six months later or a year later, they come to me and say, look, we had a problem. We had a harassment. We had some sort of discrimination issues. So we need to fix it. So fixing is always a lot harder. Um, as you can imagine. So uh, as you, if you're familiar with Slido, you will know that the most common, the biggest answer is the answer that most people submitted. So we have a common denominator here. We have starting conversations at work. Brilliant, thank you so much uh, all for your, all your answers. I'm closing the poll now. At the same time, don't forget that you can submit all your questions throughout the discussion uh, through Slido. I'm going to disable chat now just to avoid uh, chat, not just to shut you down, not, not, not to shut you down to keep you silent. You'll hear very inclusive, uh, but just to avoid uh, slide, just to avoid Zoom for being flashed and distracting speakers. Mm -hmm. So all your questions, slido.com, gender equality, and they're going to be asked uh, during your presentation. All right, moving on. Um, the way we're going to proceed today is, uh, I think it's very important to mention that we are going to focus today on a cisgender. So it's, it's cisgender female and males. So we're not going to address third gender or non-binary people. It's not because we want to exclude that but it's because the topic is already quite complex. And you want to focus on female empowerment in the workplace exclusively. And they want to complicate and sophisticate you even more. So we're going to speak about LGBTQAI uh, in the workplace on the 9th, on the 11th, I'm sorry, on the 11th of August. So if you want to talk about, if you want to uh, learn more specifically this topic, uh, you can join it. It's also part of the event series. So I hope this is okay for everyone just to create a bit of understanding in the expectation management. So these are the formalities. Um, you're all muted, the chat is disabled for the above mentioned reasons and questions are gonna be in Slido and now you're gonna move into something more concrete. And if you have already attended the events, you will know that I usually do a bit of introduction in terms of statistics, current situation, uh, on the topic in Germany, but today I decided the topic diversity when it comes to gender equality is the one the most spoken about, the most discussed topic when it comes to all diversities. And if you look at lots of companies, gender is top of the priority. So I decided you're a very educated audience at the stage, so we're going to jump straight into discussion. And with this, 
in mind, I would like to introduce our speakers. Eva, hi. <laughs> hi. Could you please introduce yourself? Who are you? What do you do? And why, why, why are you here? Yeah, uh, why I'm here. Thanks for the invitation. <laughs> and uh, thanks for setting up this um, event series, which I think it's great. I, I heard some before and I like this uh, atmosphere where we can share our thoughts and our stories and talk on a, um, yeah, on a, on a basis um, of knowledge sharing about our experiences. Um, some words um, for um, my introduction. Um, I am a um, new ways of working leader at EY, Ernst & Young, based in Frankfurt region. And I've been working for EY now for six and a half years. Um, I started as a one women show with focus on diversity and step by step I've built up my team um, starting with health, health management and occupational medicine followed by what we call work-life dynamics um, and also flexibility um, and also with two colleagues who are um, dealing with our um, employee survey for um, Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. And in this role, I, um, I'm basically, well, uh, setting the, uh, the, st the strategy for our region and planning and implementing uh, respective measures. And this goes also hand in hand with, um, well, advising our leadership and um, our business units and also our HR colleagues and teams. And I'm uh, passionate about diversity for, for years now. And um, I also uh, studied gender study, uh, studies um, when it was first, um, well, established um, in, in Germany in, uh, at the University of Freiburg. And I also studied political science and history. And I think this is the foundation that, uh, well, that with which I started my, my professional career. I uh, then went to another global media company and I worked also in the public administration. So I've seen a lot of different workplaces and also different kind of um, tackling diversity in different settings. And I would say that while well, the purpose and why I love doing what I do for well now 12 years now is really to change the world for the better. And I hope well, to make a difference and I like to join forces and join forces like, for example, talking to you, talking with uh, all the colleagues who are on the call today and who also share the passion and to well, stand up for equality and inclusion. Thank you so much. Um, our audiences, I can already imagine how excited everyone is uh, just to uh, looking forward to share learning from you and your insights. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, and Craig, who are you? Yes. <laughs> How <yeah>. are you? <laughs> yes. well, I'm fine, firstly. Thank you. And, uh, yes, nice to uh, meet interactively with, with all of you. Hopefully I can share some very useful experiences with you today from a, a male perspective because um, uh, you'll find a lot of, of what I have to say naturally comes from a, a male perspective. Um, but there are naturally those kind of um, opinions that we often miss out on when we talk about um, gender, you know, when we create women's you know, networks and things like this that we talk about. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the role of, of men, um, how some men are, are indirectly or directly fighting certain things and how some men are, are, are acting generally and, and what we can do to engage men in solving this problem, right? Um, but a little bit on my background. So I worked for Bosch, um, obviously a German company, for almost 10 years in HR and L&D uh, background, which is pretty much my career to date. And for around about three, three and a half years, I was responsible for diversity and inclusion for Bosch in the UK. Um, and what that meant was firstly raising awareness, um, being the face, driving or trying to drive real change um, among Bosch in the UK. And for those of you who know a little bit about Bosch, um, it's pretty much an amalgamation of lots of different business areas and lots of different companies doing very, very different things. 
So from an automotive base through to a home appliances, to service solutions, security solutions, the spectrum is big. So I've seen diversity play out um, in many different arenas. I've led diversity and inclusion training programs as well. Um, and really my, uh, it, it touched me personally when I, I took as a parent um, shared parental leave, which was the first time somebody did that at Bosch in the UK. Um, so I was sort of the guinea pig in a way um, for this. So I'd like to also talk a little bit about that experience and, and what that meant with my partner who also works for Bosch um, to come back to work and, and those kind of um, things too. So hopefully I can bring a little bit of a different perspective. I now live in Germany, um, Stuttgart to be precise, but I have my own training and development freelance company. Um, and part of what I'm trying to do with that company is, is promote real tangible change on these topics of diversity and inclusion. So moving beyond the kind of corporate jargon, the corporate speak that you often hear, um, especially externally on these topics, to the real things that, that people and people within organizations can do. Um, which is a little bit why I'm here today. It's a, it's a big passion of mine. So really looking forward to the, the conversation. Brilliant. Thank you so much. If you have told us before, we could have done the call in German, you know. <laughs> now you are in Stuttgart, so uh, <laughs> would be nice. <laughs> we switch later. Absolutely. <laughs> Lovely. So let's go forward with the first question. And the reminder for the audience, you can submit all your questions um, in Slido. So let's just get straight into that. Uh, Eva, what do you think, what is the current uh, situation when it comes to gender equality in Germany? Well, obviously I, I can't be satisfied. It's okay-ish. I mean, there have been many developments, progress that may, uh, has been made, but there's still so much to do. And um, I personally would recommend, I, I won't read all those numbers to you because I think this is something that um, you could maybe do afterwards, but I, I would like to share a report with you or maybe you can read many reports of them because the Swedish German Foundation, Albright Foundation, um, they are really um, good researchers and they have put together a, a huge amount of numbers and they show regularly that Germany is really falling behind when you compare uh, different companies within Europe, but also abroad. So we are really far behind when it comes to um, executive boards, women leaders at the top of an organization. And I have seen so many pictures in the past uh, where new um, executive board members were announced and it, it basically it were only men and white men in, in a certain age. So not even diverse from a cultural perspective. Um, and it's, it's really saddening that it still takes so long that uh, it's not any news anymore that a new board member is announced and, oh, she is a woman. So that's really only a name, not, not uh, a fact that, that we have to uh, talk about for days. Um, another thing that gives me hope on the other hand is that for the first time, it's really only some days old, this news, uh, the German government announced a um, interdepartmental strategy of all mi German federal ministries, which is great because they are knowledge for the first time, okay, we have to stick together. We have to be strong together to make progress in the future and not that there's only one ministry, the ministry for families and, and women that has to deal with it, but every uh, ministry with their programs, with their um, strategies has to uh, be part of this solution. And they will tackle three specific areas like um, equal pay, which is important because when you look at the lifetime, how is it possible to, um, well, to, to have equality when it comes to incomes for both women and men, how can both develop professionally and perform also their 
roles in, a, in, in their private setting. Um, and also the second one is um, how can all ministries again um, shape our future um, in terms of equality when it comes to equal representation in business, fair representation in politics and also culture and science. And then of course, it means that they as a as prof professional have to establish policies and also uh, certain rules uh, for the whole um, population in Germany, like the quota, um, the gender quota, for example, but they also have uh, to strengthen um, all, well, settings with regards to families and care work. So they have a nine point master plan that they want to roll out. And it's the first time that they really addressed the issue. I mean, it's part of our, 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 our DNA as, 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 uh, as the Grundgesetz, but it's not part of a really um, concrete action plan. And for the first time now they have established this action plan, which is great. But then again, it's 2020. And how long will it take to make all these um, points a, a reality? And I, I'm, I must say that I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit frustrated that um, it, all, it always needs these incidents, like you mentioned um, before with George Floyd on, on a racial dimension, and that it needs a certain um, incidents that uh, we now look at uh, the leaky pipeline and the talent that we have lost and that that we need uh, women and men on the table and raising their voices and that they together um, are the future of our country of our of our um, that they are the backbone of our society and and before us in, in this group, there were many other women and men fighting for certain rights. And as I said before, there is a lot of achievements that we can be really proud of. But when we see the discussions and how long it takes to, to make, them, um, the, make them reality, it's, it's for, for my, in my personal view, it's, it's taking us too long. And, um, I, I don't have the, the patience anymore to wait uh, for this change to happen. Yeah, I agree. I absolutely agree. It's, I'm really actually excited now to read this report. Um, we will we'll send everything in a follow-up mm -hmm. email to the audience. Um, thank you for mentioning that. And starting a conversation, it's the conversation should have started, I agree, a long time ago yeah. and not as a reactive measure. Yeah. But we'll see how, how, how long it will take it to achieve. And um, I really like the way it's not seen as just gender issue, but more of like yeah. holistic view mm -hmm. and how it could benefit all different parts of society. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Craig, what about you? You, you work in Bosch for 10 years, uh, but you were in UK, now you're in Germany. How is UK compared to Germany? Well, um, just Eva's uh, points there about how long will it take. Um, there was a, a study by the, the World Economic Forum mm -hmm. on um, when each country around the world should expect to reach gender equality. Um, mm -hmm. And there was a, a lot of criteria based on, you know, uh, their, their projections. And that's all they are, of course, is a projection. You can't predict accurately. But um, for the UK, it was around 70 years from now, um, seven zero years, um, which to me almost kind of, you know, I was like, whoa, um, I'm not sure exactly what it is in Germany. Maybe a, a keen audience member could, could quickly find out. But um, just for some perspective in the US, uh, in the USA, the projection was another 208 years. Yeah. Um, you know, so just for some perspective there. So coming back to the UK, I think a similar focus, as, as Ava mentioned as well, about pay and equal pay. Um, the UK government, um, I won't sing the praises of the UK government, but, but um, you know, that's a separate topic. Um, they recently, uh, or a couple of years ago now, 
introduced uh, mandatory reporting by organizations about gender pay gap. So this is looking at the females and males in an organization, looking at quartiles of pay and looking at median pay. Um, and that on the whole so far has reported around about a 17% difference in men and women in their pay. Um, which is declining slowly. I think it was 17.8 and now it's 17.2 or something like this. Um, so it's declining slowly. The, the pay for women has actually gone up, but so has the pay for men. So we're kind of seeing this constant gap, um, but just going uh, a little bit uh, up with, with time and inflation. Obviously, we don't know the impacts of, of COVID on all of these things yet, but that was the, the situation, at least in, in 2019. But I still look across um, our Financial Times Stock Exchange, so the FTSE 100 uh, top companies. And of those 100 companies, um, seven are led by female CEOs. Um, so 7%, seven companies are, are led by female CEOs, which to me still seems, you know, as we said in, in 2020, like, whoa, um, this, is, this is not enough. Um, so for me, there's lots and lots of work to be done. Um, awareness is growing. You know, it's very highly reported now with these gender pay gap examples. Um, there was a, a lot of noise in the media from the BBC, um, the British Broadcasting uh, Corporation, around differences in their uh, pay structures. So the awareness is growing, um, which is only a good thing in my eyes. So we're, we're growing, but there's, there's really a lot left to be done. Absolutely, I agree. There, is, there seems to be a lot of awareness about that, but not much action. Yeah. And this in, I really like what you said about we've come a long way. And it's really, you know, when you think about what is happening um, in US at the moment, when it comes to racism, US came a long way when it comes to racism as well. They abolished slavery, but what did it actually change the way people are treated? So I think there are lots of parallels in this sense, which is um, see, on, 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 a, on the surface, it seems that there is equality in a way, but when you dig a little bit deeper, it's a still huge gap and it still will take a very, very long time to achieve that. Um, which brings me to the next question. It's, um, do you believe, uh, either you do, do you believe uh, in gender quotas? Because I know there are some people who really think like, I, do, I don't want to be hired just because I'm a woman. I don't want to be uh, hired just for my gender. Uh, while others really um, support that. What, what is your point of view on that? It's a yes. <laughs> <laughs> because um, I think it's, really naive to think that people are just tired for their qualification. Um, and if you would do the test, if you would make your little um, uh, questionnaire again and ask those 22 people here in the call, what do you understand when someone tells you he or she is qualified? What does qualification mean? What is talent? I mean, these are always um, these are definitions, but no one is really, no, no one can say what is exactly behind the term qualification. And I'm absolutely persuasive if you have the quota, what it's not about the quota, it's about what's happening next, because then you have to talk about, okay, we don't want to just promote any women, of course. So what would be the criteria? And then we are discussing about criteria. And then we uh, realize, well, maybe we have a different understanding of qualification or what is needed for the next step or what kind of um, talent do you need to be promoted, to be hired, etc. And we had this discussion as well in our company. And then you realize there are so many definitions, so many standards that are um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the organization. Uh, and then you, have to, um, then you have to say, okay, now we are commit, committing ourselves to five to 10 criteria. And they are, they are for both women and men. 
And then you realize, okay, all those men who have been promoted in the past years, they had maybe some, they met maybe some of these criteria, but certainly not all of them. And some were just promoted because they were there long enough or had the right vitamin B. So this discussion leads to quality and not the other way around. So I had, this is also an article that I can share with you because there's also research done on this, that they say it's, it's more about getting less mediocre, mediocre men at the top. So it's really the other way around. If you have a quota, then you have to establish criteria and then you have to discuss these criteria and you have to make sure that everyone meets these standards and it's less well I, I i think it's it's the 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 fear maybe of some people or the 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 possibility that you hire a not at all qualified women is is i think it's 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 not realistic because everyone is looking who is now promoted since we have uh, established a quota. So I think it's really more about the discussion about it, uh, around it and the criteria that you have to fix and that have really, that have to be the standard for everyone. So I, I'm totally uh, for this discussion and also for this quota as a means of progressing gender diversity. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Um, that leads me to the next question. And I'm Maybe married. Craig wants to want yeah, would, yeah, 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 I will, I will, I will get, okay. get into that in a second. Um, I'm, I'm young, I'm married, and they, I, I've been working full time for about five years now, but there were some projects where there was a possibility to, to go full time or to work for a company. And before I, I'm just like, would like to challenge you on that, um, mm -hmm. Craig or, or Eva, who, who wants to answer, before maybe we go into establishing quotas, um, maybe we should also have uh, environment to set up because if I'm a small business and I have a choice to hire a young woman who's married or a young man, mm -hmm. there is a possibility for me um, that this woman might go to mater go on maternity leave. So there is a risk for me. And if there is a government that does not support that and I have to, there is not much money that I make as a small business and I have to risk it. So for me, if the government doesn't support that, I might just mitigate my risk and hire a man. Uh, so what do you think about that? Whether it, what comes first, establishing quarters or establishing the environment? Uh, for parental leave and support yeah. and not punishing women for, mm -hmm. for, for the fact that uh, you actually might give birth at some stage. Yeah. I would say there's no either or. Why waiting for um, the options to have a good childcare and waiting for um, a quota to be established? I think you need to do both. And it's, this is also the approach that we are um, uh, taking. You can't just look at the individual level. You can't just look just at the cultural level or at the organization level. You have to tackle all the three of them. So this is also the, the, the thing about diversity management. It's not a program, it's a process. And if you really want to change it, then you have to tackle all those three dimensions all the time. And this makes it also so hard. Um, but coming back to your, your question, I would say, we're talking about large corporate uh, organization and not about the small or medium sized company here. Of course, they face different challenges if you have a parent in your company. But then again, uh, it's also a question of culture. Do I have a stay in touch program to get people back on track when they uh, had their parental leave? Um, they are much more loyal to your company. They stay and they have the impression this is a company who cares for, for me as a person and not also not uh, only as a workforce. Um, and also when you look at the whole uh, time that we spend working, I mean, our generation will work until 70 
at the moment. We don't know if there's a, uh, maybe an open end some someday and we have to work until we die. I don't know. So, <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so one year of parental leave or 14 months, I mean, it's nothing compared to the whole life circle that you spend working. So it's, it's always a question, where do I put my money? Do I put it in people that I like to... Um, to stay even after a period of time of maybe I mean, it's not always about having children it's also about well following your dreams traveling the world having a yeah. sabbatical care work etc so um i think it's more this question this is really talent development and not a program but really looking at what do my people need and as i said i think a, a quarter in, and we talk about executive boards of large corporations. I think this is the minimum we should achieve. And in parallel, we have to look at our culture and the policies we do have in our own companies. Do we have childcare support? Do we have um, other support for families who are um, caregivers? Do we have um, role models who are also promoting uh, and uh, give, showing example how to, to manage both. Um, and on the other hand, just to, 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 to finish and to let Craig speak too, um, it's not about family only. When you look at all those women and men who have no children, then you would say, well, they must have the equal opportunities to get to the top of an organization, but they don't because they're still... Uh, there are still biases, stereotypes, and other assumptions that uh, prohibit women to, to reach the top. So it's not only about children. Absolutely. It's also part of it, but it's not the only reason. Absolutely. Thank yeah, you. I'd, uh, I'd, I'd echo that, actually, Ava. And I think it, it's a little bit annoying at times when we just come with this argument about um, well, should I hire this, this woman or promote this woman because maybe she'll have a child? Well, yep. you know, yeah. not, every, not every woman wants to have a child, firstly. Yeah. It's a, a huge assumption. Um, and as you quite rightly said, Ava, is you know, caring responsibilities are complex, right? Um, then they don't just involve children. They involve yeah. partners, family relatives with disabilities, caring for your parents as they get mm -hmm. older. Exactly. Um, this is not a gender um topic for me um so and in your your case uh Ola, the, the example that you just gave if this employer had hired me because they thought um you know they would have uh had somebody in the office or in the workplace for longer because this is apparently important um then they would have picked the wrong choice because i've had more time off with my son um, than my, my partner has, his mother. Um, and for me, this is where we need to get to. With We talk about policies, okay, and we talk about improving policies like maternity pay and maternity leave and, uh, and these things. But if we give equal access to leave, let's say, regardless of the responsibility, um, you know, then we don't channel people who are just wanting to have a baby to say you can have this um, if we equalize that and we try and make it so that men can take it you know the time off that perhaps the woman would have taken off normally not to give birth obviously the, the, um, you know this process is still um, <laughs> biologically the woman's um, but if if in my partner's case she, she came back to work after three months and then I took the time off um, if this was more the way we thought about these, these policies as a holistic approach, I think we will see more equality actually in you know, um, caring responsibilities for whether it's kids, elders, disabilities, whatever it might be. Um, and coming back to the point about quotas, I'm 90% with Ava in, in saying yes to, to quotas. Um, it's, it has to be dependent on what you do for me. Um, and what I mean by that is, is in knowledge work, the, the kind of areas that we're in, yes, I'm 100% for quotas. I think it brings the issue to the forefront of our mind. 
Um, I understand a little bit the, the argument. It's kind of quota versus meritocracy, right? Where, where people say, well, you know, you would be the CEO if you were good enough. Um, but this is, is proven with, with the, the greater work into unconscious bias. Um, that that's simply not the case, unfortunately, at the moment. So I think with, with pushing quotas, we can raise that awareness even higher. Um, with the subset of ensuring that the numbers are appropriate. So for an example, at Bosch, we had a quota for the, a particular level, like a vice president level of, of leader in the UK, and the aim was about 15%. At the time, this was some years back, and this was then supposed to go up and up over the years. Well, the nature of the business meant there were only eight people uh, in the organization on this level, of which one was a woman. So, okay, the quota was pretty much all right, but behind it is just one person. Um, so, I'd say we have to be very careful when we, we give numbers to understand ratios behind the numbers in any context, a number on its own doesn't really mean much. We have to understand at least the, the pipeline, the ratios to see, okay, and the levels below, where are we as a, as a ratio? Um, and when I said I agree sort of 90% with, with Ava, what I mean as well, and, and a lot of people use these arguments of, well, men are naturally biologically stronger, let's say physically stronger, um, than most women. So you look at construction as, a, as an industry, um, would it make sense to put a, a quota in that industry? I'm open to the debate, of course. Um, it's also the reason why you have male and female sports teams, right? Because physically there are differences. Why you have male and females competing separately at Olympic Games. Does it make sense to bring quotas in here? I'm not so sure. But in knowledge work, for me, 100%, yes. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Uh, what do you suggest when you say that your work needs more women in leadership, but the response is, but we don't get many women applying for these roles? I, uh, I had this, sorry to, to jump on this, but <laughs> you know, if you look at Bosch, um, and you look at a lot of companies now in the software field, um, or traditionally in the engineering fields or um, academia or government, a lot of these are male dominated, right, um, fields. And a lot of the excuse, I will call it an excuse, is well, there are not the women studying these topics. So when we go to university or whatever, there's, there's no women there for us to recruit. So how do we recruit them? Um, and this, Okay, you can see the argument because when we're young, boys, boys, generally speaking, still are pushed into things like technology, video games, these kind of things more than women who, from what I've learned and what I've understood, find these passions a little bit later on in their life. Um, so it's natural that I believe a, you have a university class or a college class in a technology field where there's still the majority point, right? So if you as an organization are going to this university or this college to recruit people, you're recruiting from an already um, disproportionate base. What we need to, I believe, do is to actually look at different pipelines. So if we are recruiting just from two or three or four institutions, um, we need to step back and ask ourselves, okay, the women who are interested in technology, who are interested in software and these topics, STEM topics as well, um, where are they going? Where are they learning? When are they learning? Can we engage them in a different way than just going our usual route of to the same university or the same institution? Because we would just get the same people then applying. Um, so I think there's a big case for looking at different pipelines, really, is my overall comment. I don't know if Eva, yeah, I mean, what, what's your thought? I'm still uh, thinking about your 10%, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, where you, uh, I, I, I just want to add something, otherwise I'm, I'm losing my thought. Um, 
because you said um, that there is this physical uh, difference and I can agree partially because when you look, for example, at the caregiving sector, which yep. is heavy work, heavy work, and there you don't have machines like in the, in the uh, sector you mentioned. So I wonder why there are less men in the caring sector, although it's heavy work and where you have to move people, etc. Whereas in the, you know, when you're building houses, et cetera, you have so many machines. And sometimes when I see those guys working there, they don't look like um, the rock themselves, you know? So um, I'm not so sure whether this uh, arguments, uh, especially in the next years where there's so much development in, in this machine sector um, will still hold. But anyways, um, I would, I, I think what you've said about the pool where we are fishing is, is one part. And I think this is exactly what I, I would say too. And the second one is you always have to ask yourself, yes, why do you get so few applications? So look at your own process. So starting from how is your wording in your job advertisements? I, I often see really kind of um, male aggressive wording, which is also not interesting for many young men, uh, by the way. So this is one thing, or the pictures that you are choosing, or the platforms where you are publishing your job adverts. Um, have you really diversified your own um, channels where you publish th those uh, job applications? Do you use uh, NGOs and groups where you could um, find a link where, for example, underrepresented groups, minorities are um, group where you can uh, share these advertisements and say, well, we are looking uh, for this and that uh, target group. Can you help us distribute this uh, job advertisement, etc." And we also did the test when it comes to, well, we have a lot of application from women, but who is uh, inviting them and who is sitting at the table from uh, not only the recruiter themselves, but also uh, those um, who are um, in, in, in the field and who is selecting uh, the candidate in the end and which questions are asked. So there are so many components in the whole recruiting process that are potentially biased. And your recruiter are biased by nature because they are human beings. So you have to educate them. You have what we have seen um, around race in the last month and where we have seen uh, so many gaps in what you think you're doing and what is uh, the outcome of your action. And also it's really unconscious. So I think no one is doing this on purpose, but there are so many um, aspects like think of Craig as a recruiter and a woman is applying for a job in a <laughs> maybe in a technical area and he would say well she is so skinny and she can't uh, lift heavy weight maybe it's not her job so and maybe she is a marathon runner and uh, does bodybuilding but you can't see it and so his assumption would be I can't hire her because otherwise she would collapse uh, in, 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 <laughs> in, in the job so this too, we have to reflect it and we have to challenge it. Uh, and it still can be the right decision not to hire the women or the black person, but we have to reflect our own assumptions, our uh, preference model, our traditions, what we have done in the, in the past and who was maybe the owner of, of uh, the position before, etc. So I would really challenge myself um, as a second part of looking where is the talent pool I'm fishing in? Um, can I, a question to you, Ava. Um, just mm -hmm. with thoughts, and, and obviously it's a good thought on recruitment, is uh, there's a lot of software available now, which is mm -hmm. fantastic, where you can remove a lot of the demographic mm -hmm. information from somebody's um, CV, okay? Further down the recruitment process, of course, you meet these people, and that's where biases, as you say, can come in. Um, but at least in the initial sifting mm -hmm. um, this can can be reduced somewhat um, in the UK it's becoming more normal to remove certain demographics um, but I still see in Germany this use of pictures for example mm -hmm. um, in CVs and for me this 
this promotes the wrong message. This is then me as a recruiter, I'm seeing a picture um, and I'm making some assumptions, uh, which hopefully I catch myself in these assumptions, but you know, a lot of people will not. Um, do you see that changing? Do you see um, that evolving in Germany? Um, bit by bit. Um, I think there are some promising starts um, where you can screen, for example, your job advertisement and see if your wording is um, maybe addressing more male applicants or not. Um, still, machines are fed by human beings, so you always have to think about what I, am I feeding this machine with? Are these my own biases, my assumptions? And um, um, tomorrow, and I, I, I hope it's okay, I, I share this with you, I will uh, release an article about recruiting and um, mitigating biases. And there I also linking in an article where um, this software is used and um, it's, it's really great in general, but for example, for people with a disability, um, these machines, when, for example, when you um, are in the spectrum of, Asper uh, of um, well, Asperger, for example, and when your emotion that you display are different to those who are perceived as normal, then you have less options to be hired in the end. So there are still many um, um, problems to be solved because they are fed by humans, but I think it helps maybe in the first or second step to uh, mitigate the major uh, mistakes that humans are doing, like judging by a picture or judging by a name, which is another huge obstacle, uh, especially in Germany, uh, when you have a Turkish name, for example, or um, a name that sounds difficult to pronounce um, so that you just, you don't want to be bothered with someone who may not speak your language, which is often also an assumption because this person could be born in Germany and feel more German than others. So this is also a stereotype that machines might not see, or maybe they um, they are the better uh, judges in this case, but it always depends how they are programmed. So mm -hmm. I think the mixture would be good because we have seen um, from the anti-discrimination um, unit from the federal government that they, they had some uh, experiments with um, anonymization of applications and it was a mixed message. So there were more women invited in the end to an interview, but then again, they met the person and Sometimes that was the point where they were uh, not chosen. Um, but for others, especially with, um, you can't hide everything, for example, the university or if you have studied at all. Uh, so there are still some parts in your biography that will be um, put in one box or the other. So I think there is room for improvement, but. I think it's the right way to at least try it, whether these machines in general will be more neutral at the beginning. And then of course, in the end, you always have to decide whether the personal fit is also given, but it shouldn't be the only uh, decision making uh, option. And often it is because either you have this gut feeling that you like this person and that you feel similar, um, or you have similar experiences and then this person is hired just because of the personal fit and not because of his or her merits. I would say the best solution for this will be probably company-wide or at least for recruiters having the unconscious bias training, at least mm -hmm. the basics to understand everything. Yeah. And from what I see, more and more companies are adopting that, um, having in-house diversity inclusion mm -hmm. trainer or having outside person coming for unconscious bias training. I see it, like at least for me, a lot more companies approach with that. Um, and I agree, like uh, we also, last week, was it last week? Yeah, last week we had a 
uh, event about inclusive language in this way we addressed a couple of um, softwares as well as publicly available free that tell you you have um, neutral language or you have very strong male dominated language in your um, in your job description so it helps but it's only the first step and we also have a comment uh, from the audience saying that discrimination starts with resume having to add birth dates family status and age let's get rid of this first but from what i know in germany you don't have to add your birth date family status or age on your resume it's not compulsory uh, also some resumes have it uh, but it's not compulsory from what i know no it's it, you Just don't to have to do it but many people do yeah. and don't do it, I think this is also kind of cultural change, then maybe it's question, do you have something to hide uh, because you don't put it on the front page? So you don't have to, it's absolutely true. You don't have it for years now, but first of all, many people don't know it. And second, uh, maybe they think, oh, maybe it's better I put it on because otherwise I don't know what uh, people might think of me not having a picture like everyone else or mm. put my birth date like everyone else. Yeah. I guess it also varies from corporates and startups uh, because we know in startups it's a completely different setup. Well, you know, traditional German corporates would or big companies in Germany would expect something, have a different process. But um, yeah. Um, I think you wanted to say something. No, no, I was no? just uh, purely Just agreeing. breathing. <laughs> You also have a question saying that uh, would you recommend, you know, keeping on the topic of recruitment and inclusive recruitment, would you recommend checking people's characteristics like gender, ethnicity, etc., during recruiting uh, to make bias in recruiting more transparent during reporting? I think it's, uh, it's important that you can be able to prove what you do with this information um, mm -hmm. because naturally and i think anybody um would would question a little bit when you're asked as we often are at the start of questionnaires and forms and applications you know um voluntary information or, or whatever mm -hmm. um are you male female prefer not to say you know or what age range do you fit into and all of these things and i still believe there is an inherent pressure to do so and as as ava i think quite rightly said there was you know, when people don't do that, you get, or I, if I was not to do it, I would get the impression that somebody in the company is perhaps thinking, well, this person is not being so open and transparent with me, so maybe they are hiding something. And you then naturally don't want them to think that, so you end up including the information. But um, I, think it's, I think it's a good thing to have awareness of, of figures, of course, because then you can, similar to the quota topic, right? You can see, where your your problems lie um let's say but it, it's it's a matter of trust and, and transparency and you see a lot of organizations have reported data leaks and and all of these things and it, it doesn't help the trust from from applicants i believe so um i think it's a good thing uh, i do um and i prefer to trust rather than not trust but i i do believe that's an individual um opinion and, and we should respect everybody's stance on that. Thank you. Um, coming back more, uh, going more into your own experiences and your own stories. Uh, we, we talked a lot about different intentions uh, and results of the, even though intentions are good, sometimes results are not exactly perfect. What kind of mistakes have you seen uh, leaders make when they have a good intention to foster female entrepreneurship or gender equality um, in the workplace and what kind of mistake did they make? Um, for me, it's, uh, a, I think a little bit of a symptom of how everything is played out in social media and online now is that it's kind of scared a lot of managers, a lot of people into inaction on these topics. Um, and what I mean by that is it's quite, unless they've had specific and very good targeted contextual training on such topics, it can be hard to give your opinion right because you're worried about how the world will react if you suddenly come out and give support for a group or um, support for a message that can get blown up so quickly via social media and 
I think it's it's quite natural in a way then that a lot of managers don't say anything or don't do anything because there is a, a fear about the reaction it might cause. Um, and this, uh, I will say it's a mistake. Um, and what, what we need to try to do, I believe, we being people who are responsible for, for diversity and inclusion in, in organisations is to encourage managers, first level, um, to ask better questions so they can understand the, the barriers, let's say, of, in this context, women in organisations. So what are the barriers that women are facing um, and, and try to understand how they as a manager can help overcome those barriers for those women. Um, and to visibly educate themselves on the topics. So not just to um, you know, say that they, they want to learn more about inequality <clears throat> or injustice or oppression or whatever, but be visible in doing it to show that they are trying to learn um, and engage with the topic. I think this is a, you know, from what I see, especially the silent majority, let's say, uh, which tends to be white men, in organizations a lot of people don't say anything um, and i believe this is a mistake well you say it was even more fostered um after me too movement and men were just too afraid to say anything and to promote a woman or go to business trip together with a woman because there is a pressure of what if something goes wrong what if i do something that and she might interpret it in a in a completely different way this Things change after Me Too movement. Um, uh, Eva, what, what, what do you think? Well, I, I think if you behave normally, then you have to fear nothing. So um, I don't. Sometimes I don't get it um, why people are afraid to be in the same elevator with a woman, uh, because if you don't touch her or do anything that's not appropriate, then you don't have to fear anything. Because this is something which I can't understand most because people think uh, or assume that uh, these accusations could be false. And I, I think this, the percentage of false accusation is so little, so little, because no one wants to be put on a spot and um, uh, ask questions about uh, a, a situation that is not um, uh, perceived as, uh, as, uh, as a good one. So... <laughs> I think it's really the more the aspect that you mentioned, Craig, to, well, you have to ask yourself questions. How did I behave in the past? What kind of decisions did I made on which basis? And for me, it's really a mistake to, first of all, think that the gender diversity question is a question for women only. It's always a question for the whole organization, for the culture which we all live and uh, work in. So it's our very own responsibility to shape this culture in a way that everyone feels included and invited and also like him or herself. Um, and sometimes it's really like, well, we put her in a mentoring program or a women's network and then the problem is gone and I don't have to care anymore. And this is not the kind how you tackle any diversity dimension and especially not the gender dimension because it always takes women and men to find and fight inequalities and to question why did we do it like this in the past and can we do it differently and let's try something new let's try something different and let's be the change we want to see ourselves um, and and this is this is the first part this it's only a women's problem thing and the second to if you think you have to do something then just to focus on an individual level and not on structures processes policies all the boring stuff in a diversity management but the yeah. most effect, effective things that lead to change yeah. and your your policy as you said it's the you know the, the, the boring stuff i find is often just there to protect the employer right it's it's something to fall back on we have an anti-discrimination policy so whenever we have a, a, an issue we have this document that we can make. but this is not what changes the culture um as you say but it's uh, i think the, the topic of you know women-led efforts 
is is such a an interesting one. I've seen it play out in you know uh, the organisation is told either by the government or its employees or they believe it uh, on a management level that they need perhaps more women in leadership. Um, so I think as you, you quite rightly said then, uh, Ava, they come up with a women's network or is, you know the one senior women is the leader of such a network um, and okay the men feel happy because they seem to be supporting something um, and the women feel happy because you know they feel a little bit more empowered um, they're in focus now so we can do something um, and from my experience with this is nothing changes um, exactly. and exactly. What, what I mean by that is that um, the, the senior women get more people on board, they hold events, they do talks, you know, and all of these things. But do the numbers of women in leadership positions change because of it? No. Um, instead, uh, what, what happens then is after some time, people get frustrated. The men think, well, we've given the women these wonderful opportunities that we never gave them before, but they couldn't do something about it. Um, and the women think, well, you can tell me what the women think. My interpretation and the feedback <laughs> I've got on the women's thoughts is um, that, well, you know, nothing, nothing yeah. was possible to change because for other reasons. Yeah. Um, and I think we're completely, and I'm glad we've got a, a mix here today is um, we need both men and women on these initiatives, yeah. right? Um, and we need to focus on equality, bridging gaps where they exist, um, and actually to treat these things like a business project. Mm -hmm. This is where I've seen it work, right? So instead of having a nice fluffy coffee morning and some cake, yeah. we treat it as a project. We assign some key performance indicators. We assign some responsibilities and budget, and we treat it like a project um, because then you push at least some, some proper actions. Um, and we need the men, the senior men, the, the, the better, to confront other men on the topic, on the need for balance, on the need for yeah. awareness on these things. We need the male-to-male -male discussions to take place where I don't believe those discussions are in enough depth and with enough meaning today. I agree completely. It's the same topic, you know, coming back to, you know, the first uh, starting point of the race and discrimination topic that we had is, uh, it's the same, it's buying in people who have stronger voices, you know, when it comes to gender equality, men have much stronger voices than women. And when it comes to racism and discrimination, white folks have much stronger voices. Otherwise, if you're in an underrepresented group, and then you discuss racism, you've seen as Oh, you're complaining again, just get over it. But if someone, you know, like us here, you know, very privileged, uh, talk about these issues, you, your voice is suddenly much stronger in this unfair, but that's the way it is. Um, so I completely have to agree with, in, you know yourself how I was so eager to get, I had said, I, there is no way I will have a gender equality event with only women sitting and talking about that because that creates, um, exclusion there is no inclusion when it comes it will be very bizarre if you have that talk about and i have seen lots of events like this and a lot of initiatives like this when you talk about diversity and inclusion uh and gender equality and uh, women empowerment and you have only women uh in the house or at the event or in a panel and that's that it doesn't bring things forward in my opinion and uh, we have a little comment as well from the, from the audience uh, saying that uh, regarding fearing false accusations, I'd say it's a judgment of the men's own perception of women if they only see them as potential sexual partners or even victims. Yes, that's a good point too. Very yeah. good. Very good point. Uh, thanks very much for this comment. Um, and coming to what we just discussed in terms of failed programs and failed and mistakes, what are the good programs that you have seen that thrive, that really worked really, really well from your own experience to get more into um, hands-on and more practical from your perspective? Eva? Um, well, um, as I may have mentioned, I'm not a fan of programs, but of processes. So 
those companies who've worked out their very own HR processes, really going through every step of the employee life cycle, um, they are the most successful instead of launching a program. Of course, you can have these nice little things like awareness campaigns or a special diversity day. I'm not against it at all. I like these days and I like and have fun to participate in these kind of actions, but they won't change anything. It's, it's really like, it's the cherry on top. It's, it's great when you can do it. And it's also when you think of smaller companies, when they think, oh my God, I can't afford to have a diversity manager or a program, this is expensive. You don't have to, because when you look maybe with your own focus groups from within your company, but maybe you ask, you can go to schools or universities uh, and ask groups, when I show you this advertisement or when I would ask you to apply for this job, what would be your first impression? Would it be intriguing? Would you would like to apply? What are your thoughts? So do a little market research, but without much money or time, but really challenge your own view on how you are perceived from an outside perspective and then challenge every single step within your organization and within the employee life cycle, not only when it comes to recruitment, but also promotion, mm -hmm. uh, alum, alumni programs, etc. So everything where people are involved and where decisions are made. And then you will see, oh, uh, it's, it's easy to attract other groups that we haven't thought of yet because um, I, I, I have, a, for example, an, uh, an example, what is very important, at least in Germany, um, is your um, other notes, grades uh, you received, um, for example, in, in uh, at the A-level or at the university. But for some jobs, you don't need A-levels. For example, when you uh, work uh, for in, in a technical uh, profession, it's not important that you are good in German or in, in your second language or in literature, etc but it's good to have a general understanding how things work. So when you have uh, not so good grades on your A-levels, for example, then you are maybe not even getting close to be interviewed. So what the Deutsche Bahn, for example, did years ago that they said, we don't care about your A-levels because this is a time in your life. You are young, maybe you are not so... Uh, interested in learning whatever the reasons are or maybe you, you hadn't the education because of your background at home your social background there are many reasons why you may be not finishing your a levels with a good grade so when it comes to your motivation and the 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 inner purpose why you want to work for us this is more important than any grades you have so they change it and it opened really the the pool where they could attract much more talent than just to go to um, the the schools and ask those who are maybe privileged to have this kind of an education to finish this education properly instead of asking who wants to work for us and uh, not looking at the grades and this is a, a change in your process and in your thinking of what is our traditional hiring what is our preference model why do we like to have only educated people working uh, on on site where it's really not necessary to have good grades in literature for example so i think rethinking your own processes instead of establishing more programs uh, that are often not linked to each other or have maybe uh, completely different uh, targets or completely different um, well uh, also intentions so I think as uh, Craig said the attention of a mentoring is a good one I think it's people like the idea because it's simple it's easy it's it's not cost intensive but it's not changing anything mm -hmm. and if the target or the 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 progress you want to achieve is getting more women uh, to the top then you have to choose another measure or to um, focus on your processes instead of having a program. It's really depending on what do you want to achieve. Yeah, it, I think it's a very, very good point because like programs, it's more for visibility quite often. And it's 
also very like short-term solutions yeah. like having a bandage while very painful and yeah. very difficult long, and very long, like looking yeah. into the mirror and seeing the ugly face of a company sometimes when you see all those things that you need to work on requires a lot more dedication a lot more commitment and a lot of changes and people don't like changes so that's why the solution is quite often just okay let's establish a launch a program and then uh, tick a box and then move forward so I really, I really like the approach in terms of you know going much deeper into yourself as a company and changing the system and processes and digging 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 much deeper thank you a lot of what we, uh, a lot of what we say just we create so many processes and programs um, and we pay consultants thousands of pounds and I think a lot of the answers are already inside our organization if we just actually ask the people particularly the minority groups or the groups in focus find out what their barriers are and actually do something about it you know get their suggestions and do something um, I know that's oversimplification but Sometimes we can layer up so many of these potential solutions and we've not even sat down with the people we're trying to find the solution for and ask them what they want um, and what they feel and how they feel it. Um, and I think this is a very, very simple place to start for any organisation. Absolutely. Um, a quick question from the audience. We have uh, two more questions and not so much time left, unfortunately. Um, can we expect most people to think about and discuss the topic of DNI like we do here, or can some people outsource the topic to other people in society? I don't really understand the question, to be honest, but. Me neither. Can you maybe. Yeah. Can we expect most people to think about and discuss the topic of diversity inclusion like we do here? Uh, or can some people outsource the topic to other people in society? That, that, that's ignorance, in my opinion. If you want to outsource and just pretend. I, I don't quite understand the question. Maybe you'll get some clarification um, from the audience in a bit. Uh, please, whoever wrote it, you could just clarify it uh, in, in Slido, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. Um, I have one last question. I will say second to last question before we uh, do a bit of recap. Um, Madeline Upright once said, there is a special place in hell for women who don't help each other. Um, and let me be a little bit of a devil's advocate uh, here. At the same time, some believe that a lot of women uh, not only not support each other, but bring, them, bring each other down. Uh, and when you work in a not my personal opinion, but the, there is a belief and uh, there are only women working together, it becomes counterproductive, brings too much emotion and causes tension, gets very political. And some senior women are afraid of the competition if they reach the top. Um, that some younger ladies are better than her can take over and eliminate and they decide to eliminate competition and instead of taking this uh, potential leader under her wing and raising her what are your thoughts on that well i love that quote because i and i'm using it very often my my trainings for for our colleagues but i think it has nothing to do with being emotional or um, tense or however women are described because this would be mean that we are all the same and there are so many different leaderships among women and among men um, so this is another I think problematic stereotype about women to label them and put them in a box as being totally unrational when they work together or bossy or uh, I don't know um, I think it's always good to mix it. This is what inclusion would look like, not have women or male-only teams. This is always good. But um, I think um, the most important part, and every leader has to ask him or herself the question, um, whether um, I'm pushing someone else's career, let some, someone else shine. And um, I think... This is the part of being an inclusive leader, um, giving space to others, um, let everyone feel that he or she belongs and can really contribute to 
a task or a challenge. And I would really, really uh, want to uh, erase that stereotype that women are emotional. And yeah. the problem is what happens when they are not? Then they are cold, cold. and <laughs> what? They're worst, worst words. And I think, okay, now you want her not to be emotional, then she isn't. And then it's also not uh, fine. So what do we want? Um, and I think not looking on people in terms of representatives of a group, but more in case of you are an individual in front of me. You are not representing all women. And if you are not helping me, and if you are uh, not supporting my career, then it's because you have an issue and not women have an issue. And I have to talk to you or ask you why uh, I can't have your support and your guidance. And there are, as I said, so many different people, so many different leaderships, and it's not something that we inherit or that it's it's given us by birth. It's it's every time um, something that we learn throughout our own professional and personal careers. So this is something that we have to challenge. And as Craig said before, for example, when it comes to male leadership, that other men have to challenge. Uh, among themselves whether their behavior is fine or not and the same is true for women not every woman is a good leader but nor is every man a good leader so I think we have really to look at an individual basis and less on this group thing yeah yeah thank you yeah I, uh, I, I again completely <laughs> that. and this whole I hate this it's such an assumption and a stereotype yeah. of, you know, yes, women are <laughs> emotional or whatever. I mean, this is rubbish, you know. Yeah. This is just a, an easy excuse, perhaps, yeah. sometimes, yeah. not to hire a woman or not to promote a woman or, or something like this. And, you know, you, we take it back. And before we all dialed in, uh, Ava and I were saying we're not robots, right? We're people. We have emotions, you know. I'm a father. I don't think I've cried as much. Um, in my life as I have the last two years um, you know okay I'm more emotional that's good no I'm, I'm, I'm in touch with that more I think this is a healthy thing um, so when we use these these phrases and these terms of too emotional I think this is just a, a very very basic and easy way out of actually tackling a, a, a situation and this shouldn't be happening um, and as Ava said again, you need women helping women, you need men helping women, and you need women helping women. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we have just a couple of minutes um, left, and the clarification has arrived from the previous question. Thank you very much for clarifying that. Are people allowed to not think in depth about diversity inclusion and rely on other people to fix the problem? Can we expect every can we expect everyone to be an expert in diversity inclusion? I think those are two different questions. Um, you know, can we expect everybody to be an expert? No. Um, but does everybody have a role? For me, yes. Um, as long as you have a voice and, a, and a, you're, a, you're an individual, you have a role in, in making equality happen, especially if you're a manager or somebody with influence and let's say power in a traditional hierarchical organization um, for sure absolutely and I think it's everybody's responsibility to at least try and educate themselves a little bit more on these topics um, to try and understand and bring it back to empathize um, with the other group to try and understand their thoughts and their feelings and how things are from their perspective because yeah. I know how things are from a man perspective in an organization. I have absolutely zero knowledge of how things are from a woman perspective. Um, so it's important that we share our stories and that we educate ourselves where possible on those other perspectives. So I think we do all have a role, yes. Thank you. Eva, do you want some, anything to add to that? No, this time I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> nothing to add beautiful beautiful uh then i would say what will be your last uh, couple of 
words of wisdom to the audience um, and the last key takeaways from today and kind of concrete steps that people in organizations, if they want to uh, strengthen the diversity inclusion uh, in the company or address the gender equality in the company, what are the concrete things they can do? Well, I have one sentence, I think, which summarizes it in a way. I would say, don't fix the woman, fix the organization. And this is also true for don't fix the minorities, fix the organization. Beautifully said, thank you. Very good, very good. And uh, yeah, listen, I think I said it before, don't assume anything. Listen, ask questions. Um, I believe the people in the organization have the answers. I really do. Um, you just need to engage with them. Thank you. Um, I also really recommend the book, Invisible Women. Um, I think it's a quite interesting. Um, I could send all the links after. I'm not sure if, if uh, any of you or the audience read it, but I highly enjoy that in terms of uh, seeing how the world sometimes in many ways is designed having men as in men by default and the men designed for them and where could the organization and the world change in the way of addressing women's um, as a society um, issues or in, in that was exactly what it said don't fix the women don't don't blame it on the women but uh, fix the organization fix the society Good, that's um, all for today. Thank you the audience for staying with us. Uh, thank you for the great questions. Really, really enjoyed that. Thank you so much uh, to Eva and Craig. Really a pleasure to have you here today. And um, this session is recorded. So I will send a follow-up email tomorrow or day after tomorrow with the recording, with the books, with the reports mentioned by Eva, with the articles and so on and so forth. We also have a LinkedIn group where all the resources are going to be posted. And uh, if you want to have a discussion there, you can do that. Uh, all links are going to be sent there. Next week, we have an event um, on diversity inclusion, on the topic of narrow diversity. So if you're interested in the topic, uh, you're more than welcome to join us. It's again, once again, Tuesdays, 5 p.m. Uh, my name is Olegan Helios. It's please connect, please send questions. Uh, let's have a virtual coffee. Happy to hang out, happy to uh, connect with people and have a continued discussion. Once again, thank you everyone and uh, happy to have your feedback. Have a nice evening. <laughs>